Hello. Although my work is mostly in the field of public policy, today I will talk to you mostly about physics, the physics of energy supply. One of the reasons why our so-called energy policy is so incoherent is precisely the scandalous disregard for some fundamental basic physical constraints on humanity's energy supply. Clearly, <coughs> modern civilization is unthinkable without consistent, powerful, and for now growing inflows of energy. All this moving, cutting, lifting, welding, uh, heating, cooling, spraying, you name it, that we call our economy, takes a lot of work which simply cannot be done without <coughs> major inflow of energy. In fact, if such flows of energy did not start circulating through the economy, life and economy would not have changed that much since the time Adam Smith was writing. At the time he was writing in 18th century England, the most advanced form of manufacturing was the occasional river-powered mill with up to 300, 400 workers. That was it. Only after James Watt perfected the steam engine and started to commercially deploy throughout all branches of industry, the Industrial Revolution was able uh, to take place. Although it would be more accurate to call it the Coal Revolution because this progress was entirely energy driven by heat engines doing the work. As clever as all these epoch making innovations were, they simply enabled access to and required the consumption of more energy. Clearly our civilization is unthinkable without these inflows. And if we want the future to look anything similar to the present, at least vaguely, we need to understand the feasibility of continuing uh, this energy-intensive civilization in perpetuity. Unfortunately, in foreseeable future, just maintaining constant inflow of energy, much less growing, will be pretty difficult. <coughs> but why? Well, fundamental laws of thermodynamics have very important lessons for us which we should heed unless we want to get caught with our global pants down. First, the energy of the universe is constant. It is constant. It cannot be created or destroyed. The only thing it does is to transition from one form into another. And of course, work, which we depend on, is one such form of transformation. Second, this transition always go, goes in only one direction, from higher energy intensity to lower energy intensity the so-called constant degradation of energy, the constant reduction in energy's ability to do work. So when you drive your car, you're not destroying energy. You're simply converting the energy in your fuel into a little bit of motion, but mostly heat, which dissipates in the environment. You didn't destroy the energy. It's still out there. The only problem is it can never be used to do work again, ever. These abstract laws have direct implications for our energy options. And the most important one is that energy can only be used once. It is not something we can reuse, recycle, or substitute at will. Second implication is that we don't have energy problem. What we really do have is a fuel problem. Due to the second law of thermodynamics, entropy makes sure that systems with high potential energy that can be liberated to do work are very, very, very rare. In fact, there are only two such sources, chemical energy, accessible to us through fossil fuel, and nuclear energy, accessible to us either through fission in nuclear reactors or through fusion in the sun. That's it. <coughs> we cannot invent new sources of energy. Now, speaking of fuels, clearly our civilization at present is overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels. The small proportion of nuclear and hydroelectric is virtually <coughs> invisible. And fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, they are essentially products of the same process, photosynthesis. They just got cooked slightly differently uh, geologically. And they're also finite. <coughs> We've built a civilization entirely dependent on a very 
definitely finite resource. This would be a problem even if energy use was constant, but it is growing very fast. It is growing faster than population growth due to economic development. So, by the middle of the century, energy demand will at least double, and at that time, even if population stabilizes, which it hopefully it will, by the end of the century, we will need three times the amount of energy we use today. <coughs> Where is it going to come from? Let's start with the infeasible options. First, it is not going to come from fossil fuels. This is why we're having this conversation. The, we have been consuming fossil fuels at an exponential rate, and this must reach a peak eventually and then steadily begin to decline. There is no place in nature where a quantity can go, grow at an exponential rate indefinitely. With one bizarre and mysterious and vaguely scary exception, of course, which is the economist's brain, <laughs> who insists that you know, new technology, high prices, will bring more resources um, online. Unfortunately, this has nothing to do with price. This is a physical necessity because at any price, the extraction of any resource starts with the most easily accessible resource, then you move into a harder and harder and harder to access resource until your rate of extraction reach, reaches a global peak and then needs to begin to decline. <coughs> Currently, we have burned through about half of our oil supplies. Combined, the world has probably around 100 years left of liquid fuels, um, oil and gas. Coal is the most abundant fossil fuel, which will probably suffice for another 300 to 500 years, although the environmental implications of that are already considered unacceptable. <laughs> now, what about renewables? Time, time for some tough love. <clears throat> it is not going to work because they suffer from the fundamental limitation of being high entropy sources, meaning that they are very diffuse and uh, the energy they give access to is sort of ambient. We need to expand energy in order to be able to make it to do any work. So they will never be able to replace substantial chunks of the energy supply. <clears throat> the only possible exception is solar, however it is very far in the future. Our ability to harness solar energy is incredibly bad. Even if you imagine for a second that we magically outfit every residence with solar panels, this will still only cover about 11% of our energy needs without doing anything for industrial transportation needs and without doing anything for uh, intermittency, etc. So, things would be pretty dismal if we weren't sitting uh, on a gold mine. Practically, all of Earth's energy supplies are concentrated in the nuclei of uranium and thorium. In comparisons, all the power of fossil fuels just pales. <clears throat> so, is that the solution? Just build uh, more nuclear reactors? Well, yes, but unfortunately there are a few wrinkles, none of which have to do anything with safety. The wrinkles are that our current generation of nuclear power is a byproduct of the nuclear weapons industry, which wasn't concerned with resource efficiency or waste. Our current reactors run on this green slice that you can barely see, a uranium isotope which is very rare in nature. At current rate of consumption, we will deplete it in about 50 years. In order to utilize the physically abundant uranium-238 and thorium, we need a deployment of the so-called fast reactors. However, for them to work, they require the physically limited uranium-235. Think of, think of the physically abundant uranium as a huge pile of wet wood, which we could use, but it will be useless unless we conserve the matchbox. Right now, we're burning, we're maintaining the fire with the matchbox. So, we pretty much need to stop uh, the build-up build of new uh, of present generation nuclear reactors. As for safety, the fast reactor have the ad advantage that they produce much less waste. In fact, their main advantage achievable through the so-called closed fuel cycle is the ability to reprocess waste, which means that you don't have to worry about storing it and the waste you have has much shorter half-lives. <coughs> now, 
Usually, the first concerns in regard to nuclear energy relate, relate to safety. Unfortunately, such concerns are so vastly overstated that they have virtually no correlate in reality. Even the most notorious nuclear incident in Chernobyl resulted in 50 direct deaths, mostly plant and rescue workers who heroically sacrificed their lives to mitigate the damage. And then over 25 years, the estimated indirect deaths due to additional cancers that might have been triggered by radiation ranges anywhere between 4,000 to 25,000. Keep in mind that most of the estimates cluster in the, around the 4,000 number. I'm just being generous. Uh, Fukushima, virtually non-story. The earthquake and the tsunami directly killed 20,000 people. The estimated extra cancer deaths range anywhere between 50 and 1,000. <clears throat> of course, any death for any reason is tragic. And that's precisely why we need to choose the least deadly option. And that, by a wide margin, is nuclear power. It is 4,000 times less deadly than coal, which, through pollution and industrial incidents, has killed far more people than nuclear ever has. That's why, in considering the nuclear energy safety implication in isolation, we not only overstate them, but we also forget the fact that things could hardly get any more worse than the status quo. Well, in fact, they could. In the absence of comprehensive nuclear energy strategy, coal being the most abundant resource on Earth, absence of strategy will result in a knee-jerk flight into coal. Since it's available, it will provide some relief, and that would be a disaster. Just because I don't have the time to also consider the environmental implications of transition to nuclear energy doesn't mean that they're not extremely important. This is a coal train, between a mile and a mile and a half long, full of coal. An average coal-fired plant burns one every single day. Considering that there are more than 50,000 power plants in the world, 50,000 of these bad boys get burnt out in the atmosphere and in your lungs and in your fish on a daily basis. So, in conclusion, I would challenge you even further, not only to rethink your attitude towards nuclear energy, but also by insisting that it is intellectually inconsistent and contradictory position to have a strong pro-environmental attitude and at the same time a strong anti-nuclear stance. I hope you consider the facts on your own, and whenever you do that, I hope you do it in close proximity to a nuclear power plant. It is far safer and healthier than under any of these smoke-spewing machines. Thank you very much.